Good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many people uh, here uh, on a uh, Friday, a beautiful Friday afternoon in uh, Providence, uh, Rhode Island. My name is uh, Richard Locke. I'm a professor of political science and international public affairs, and I currently serve as provost. And it's a great uh, pleasure for me to welcome you to Brown, some of you back to Brown, uh, and all of you uh, to tonight's uh, Mickle John Lecture, which is sponsored by the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy. Now, before I invite the Taubman Center director, Professor Susan Moffat, to the stage to introduce our distinguished speakers, I want to just offer a few brief remarks about the significance of tonight's lecture. We are, Brown's actually incredibly fortunate to have a number of uh, named lectures. Uh, and these named lectures give us opportunities to bring exceptional scholars, but also practitioners to campus to speak on a wide range of topics. And these lectures, many of you I've, I've seen attending these lectures, these lectures, as you know, animate our campus. And together with our teaching and research, they're an essential part of what we try to do which is to advance knowledge and educate future leaders. And tonight, we have this additional bonus, since the Meckeljohn Lecture Series has allowed us to bring two extraordinary alumni, Chris Hayes and Kate Shaw, back to campus. So thank you so much for being here. It's really wonderful to welcome you back. Um, the Alexander Meckeljohn Lecture was named for Brown alumnus and Brown, uh, former Brown dean, Alexander Meckeljohn and focuses on the theme of freedom and the US Constitution, which we'll be talking about today. And thanks, Corey, for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about these important issues. Uh, Alexander Mickeljohn graduated from Brown in 1893 and served as its dean from 1901 to 1912. Supreme Court Justice William Douglas delivered the first Mickeljohn lecture in 1963. But more recent speakers include NPR legal affairs correspondent Nina Totenberg and Harvard University um, law professor and former law school dean Martha Minow. Now we are delighted to be launching the academic year with the timely and important discussion on the US Constitution and why current and future aspiring presidents should understand it and be guided uh, by it. Uh, these are challenging times for several core institutions in our country, for different branches of our government, for the media, for the fundamental principles like the separation of power and checks and balances, but also for higher education, for universities like Brown. The core, the core underlying values of universities like Brown are being challenged. Core values like the importance of scientific research and facts to help us understand, let alone mitigate, great challenges like climate change. The centrality of critical thinking and free inquiry as we come together to try to think through some of society's most pressing issues. And the fundamental importance of diversity and policies like affirmative action that help us create truly diverse and inclusive communities. All of these uh, basic principles are under attack these days, uh, under attack by different agencies of our government. Just think of the Department of Education, Department of Justice, and what they're doing or trying to do uh, with uh, affirmative action. Uh, think of parts of our media, not these parts of our media, but other parts of our media, and uh, of course, other external uh, lobbies. And so, as members of this university community, I think it's really important that we sort of double down and try to do a better job translating all the great work we do in our teaching, our research, our outreach to a broader public and to policymakers so that we can not only resist these attacks, but also, and more importantly, so that we can continue to serve as agents of social mobility and positive social change in our society. This is our core mission. This is what universities can be, should be, and this is what our society today really needs us to be. That's true for higher education, but I would say it's true for many other institutions in our society today, and this is why today's session is especially timely and important. 
So to introduce tonight's panelists and set the stage for our discussion, please join me in welcoming Professor of Political Science and Director of the Taubman Center, Susan Moffat. Thanks. Welcome. It's great to see you all here tonight. I'm Susan Moffat, the Director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy. The Taubman Center focuses its research and its programming on three themes, the cost of living, the value of democracy, and the price of security. And the Nickel John Lecture is an important part of our programming each year on the concept of democracy. As the provost mentioned, Alexander Micklejohn was not only a Brown University alumni, but he was also a renowned civil libertarian. Um, so important, in fact, that Corey mentions him in his book. Corey writes that Micklejohn transformed free speech from a right of personal expression into an article of democratic rule. I look forward to talking about that more with all of you tonight. And in this spirit of Alexander Micklejohn, an alumnus of Brown University, we're delighted to welcome back two alumni of Brown University, Kate Shaw and Chris Hayes. Kate Shaw is a professor of law and the co-director of the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy at Cardozo School of Law. Before joining the faculty of Cardozo, she worked in the White House Counsel's Office as a special assistant to the president and associate counsel to the president. She clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens of the US Supreme Court and for Richard Posner of the US Court of Appeals Second, Seventh Circuit. Professor Shaw is an expert on a wide range of topics, some of which you read about in her, her publications today, including constitutional law, administrative law, the Supreme Court, election law, and gender and sexual orientation law. She's a prolific scholar whose work appears in many leading law journals. Chris Hayes is the host of the Emmy Award winning MSNBC program, All In with Chris Hayes. He is also the editor at large of The Nation. Chris has been a fellow at Harvard University Safra Center for Ethics, as well as a fellow at the New America Foundation. His essays, articles, and reviews appear widely and cover a range of important political and social issues, including union organizing, the intersection of politics and technology, and economic democracy. His latest book, A Colony and a Nation, is going to be the topic of a conversation here at Brown University tomorrow morning. Chris and Kate, welcome. We're delighted to have you back at Brown. We hope you come again soon and often. And Corey Brettschneider is professor of political science here at Brown University. He works at the intersection of constitutional law and democratic theory. He's written many influential articles and several books on constitutional law. His latest one, of course, is The Oath in the Office, the topic of our conversation tonight, which Kirkus calls required reading for all Americans. Corey, thank you for giving us such a great reason to get together tonight. And our time together tonight will unfold in the following way. Corey will begin with about 20 minutes of discussion of his book. And then we'll turn the floor over to Kate, who will offer some commentary for about 10 or 15 minutes. Chris will then offer some commentary for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then they will engage in conversation together for about another 20 minutes. And then we will open up the floor to your questions. We very much look forward to your questions. But because there are so many of us tonight, we would invite us all to be mindful of our airtime. This includes me. So when it is your turn to ask a question, please ask one direct question and then share the air with your colleagues. We can then continue our conversation out in the foyer afterwards for a book signing reception afterwards. Now, will you please all join me in very warmly welcoming Kate Shaw, Chris Hayes, and Corey Brettschneider. Thank you all. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, Kate and Chris, thanks for coming back. Um, as I look out there, I see there are a good number of young people, and my guess is that there's at least one person out there who thinks, you know what? I could probably be President of the United States. Now that might have been true before, but now there is an especially low bar. So there might be more than one of you, there might be a couple. 
So let's talk about what you need to know if you want to be President of the United States, given that many of you are probably thinking about it just, just now. Uh, we have to begin with Article 2 that lays out the job description. Article 1, of course, sets up the Congress. And Article 2 gives a set of powers, very specific powers to the President, but also limits them. The powers are granted with the idea that the President won't go beyond that. And the place that you really see that up front is in the requirement of an oath of office. It's actually spelled out word for word. I don't want to get it wrong, so I'm going to read it to you. Article 2 says that in the, literally the first second you become president, the first thing you do is you read the following thing. I do solemnly swear, you can also affirm, that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Now, that idea of the oath is probably pretty different from the reasons that a lot of people might be motivated to run in the first place. Uh, you might want to have the control of Air Force One. You might want the White House and the cook and all the things that come with it. But the idea of the oath is of a constrained presidency. I think that's not something that we often see in our politics, get that idea that we would run for the modesty of the office. I'll say that wasn't true for me when I was uh, about nine. My father worked for a local politician. And the biggest event of the year where we lived in Queens was Queens Day. And Queens Day was in the middle of the summer. It was, uh, Chris is from the Bronx, so I guess he didn't come to Queens Day, but maybe he joined us. Uh, <laughs> We, we, I was walking behind this politician uh, and the mayor of New York City, Ed Koch. They were in front of me. It was a huge, maybe the biggest moment of my life up to that point. And Koch, when he would walk, he would throw his arms back and he'd say, how am I doing? How am I doing? He's walking around this parade. And it was so hot, he turns to an aide next to him, actually to the politician. He says, uh, you know what? I'd like some ice cream, vanilla. And the uh, politician turns back and snaps at the aide walking next to me and says, get the mayor of vanilla ice cream. This guy runs across the field at like top speed, grabs the vanilla ice cream somehow without toppling it, brings it back and hands the mayor this vanilla ice cream. And you know what I said to myself? I want to be mayor of New York <laughs> City. Of course. Now that idea of being mayor, or as some had it, there was another guy from Queens who might have attended an event like this, uh, is very different from the idea of the constrained presidency that I laid out, the idea of Article Two. The person who got it best, the right understanding, not the ice cream version, the right idea of the presidency was of course, maybe not a surprise to all of you, but the second inaugural address by George Washington. It is so short, it's 135 words. I'm gonna read it to you, or at least the highlight. He said, I've just taken the oath of office, specifically this oath, which I am about to, sorry, he's about to take it, about to take in your presence, that if it shall be in any instance violated willingly or knowingly, the injunctions thereof, I may, besides incurring constitutional punishment, be subject to the upbraidings of all who are witness of the present ceremony. That's it. And think of the meaning of the words, right? That is the idea of the constrained, limited presidency. He's saying, I'm about to take the oath, but once I take it, what it binds me to is this idea of the office, which is limited. Not only that, but if I mess it up, if I violate the Constitution, then stop me. Do two things, specifically criticize me or upbraid me, and also subject me to constitutional punishment. That's the lost idea of the presidency that I'm hoping to get us back into tonight, to describe to you, to talk about. And notice when we look at, as Washington did, the oath very carefully, it's not just not to violate it, but it's to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, not the country. This isn't warlike language. It's the language of restraint. And that's the idea of the presidency, I think, that we've lost as time has gone on, not just in the present moment where things are being brought into relief enough that we're really aware of it, but before that as well. In fact, I think it probably started, if you look at Woodrow Wilson's presidency, 
Wilson had a very different idea of the oath of office from Washington. He was actually a constitutional scholar, a, law, a constitutional law professor at Princeton. He knew what he was talking about and he knew what he was doing. His idea of the presidency was that it was a unique office, that the president was in his terms a leader who had direct authorization from the people in the country to go in many ways beyond the Constitution itself. It wasn't just Article II that gave him the power, it was the election of the people. And that, he thought, gave him uh, a unique role, not just an equal role. In Washington's inaugural, he was talking to uh, members of uh, the other branches, to members of the Senate and the House of Representatives. There was an idea of the presidency as equal among the branches. Wilson was trying to break out of that. Now, one way that he did it was with the creation, the, the bully pulpit was probably created by Teddy Roosevelt, but he used it to constitutional effect to go beyond these other branches of government. He had a press office and deliberately tried to use the bully pulpit in order to rally the people of the United States to pressure Congress to act in the way that he wanted. He wasn't going to be beholden to these other branches. When you look at the content of what he said, uh, it wasn't terrific. In fact, it was way worse than that. A lot of the things that we might in the present moment think are unprecedented when it comes to race and ethnic prejudice were present in large part during that presidency. So in Birth of a Nation, a film celebrating the Ku Klux Klan, he, Wilson, is celebrated with two block quotes that are taken from his scholarly work, praising the Klan. And rather than hide from that, he highlights it, using the bully pulpit newly created to film Birth of a Nation in the White House, playing, of course, to his southern constituency, uh, at least part of it that wanted to see this sort of uh, racialized uh, speech. Now, he knew better. As I said, he was a constitutional law professor. He knew about the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and the idea that the Constitution meant respect for people regardless of race or ethnicity. And I believe that he should have known that the decision at the time, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, was wrong. Now, when it came to the bully pulpit, Courts aren't going to police presidential speech. They're not going to say, say this or don't say that. And we'll talk more about that. Um, but uh, a president has an obligation, right? Not just to do what the courts require, but to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And that speech was in many ways opposed to it. Now, the tricky thing for a president, and this gets to Micklejohn, who we've heard twice about already, terrific, my favorite unpublished author. Uh, the book has not been republished in a long time since the 60s, but should be. But Micklejohn stressed the idea that although early in the century during Wilson's time, for instance, people could be punished for unpopular or wrong-headed speech, that we should have a simple rule of the First Amendment. Viewpoint neutrality, everyone is respected regardless of their opinion and not penalized for it. Early in the Republic, there was a very different idea. John Adams signed and the Congress passed the Alien Sedition Act, making it a crime to criticize the President of the United States. Interestingly, you could criticize the Vice President of the United States, a member of a different party, Thomas Jefferson. This was a partisan use of the criminal law to go after your opponents. Now, what Micklejohn helped to do, and I'm very honored to be giving the Micklejohn Lecture, was to change the rules so that wouldn't happen again. There was no Supreme Court, by the way, at the time that was going to intervene on behalf of the First Amendment and stop John Adams, who was using the law, the law to criminalize opposition speech that just opposed him. Um, but later, due to Micklejohn and several court decisions, the rule came about that no person, no Congress, no executive order, no president can make a law that punishes based on opinion. Now you start to see one of the dilemmas. A president has to respect even speech that opposes the Constitution, even speech like the Ku Klux Klan, the recent jurisprudence has brought about. So how can a president both respect speech but also defend the Constitution? He or she can't do it through the criminal law. And one answer again, I think, is in the bully pulpit. So when you think of um, the second President Bush, 
uh, after 9-11, he said Islam is a religion of peace. He spoke out in favor of Islam, of protecting it, uh, even though there were uh, many criticizing it. President Obama didn't ban the burning of a Koran on the uh, west coast of the United States. He said we have to protect it, but also he, like Bush, sought to condemn it. A president has to recognize that you can't use the presidency to make speech illegal, but a president also has to use his or her own speech to protect, preserve, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Now, courts would intervene to stop a president, I believe, or stop anyone, a government official, that tried to shut down criminally speech, like the Alien and Sedition Act. But there are other moments where presidents actually might not be stopped by courts. One is in the Eighth Amendment, a president has to respect the ban on cruel and unusual punishment. But many courts have refused, in fact, courts have not intervened when presidents, when the second President Bush, uh, uh, had a policy of torture in order to extract information or waterboarding. But part of the point is that it's not about, and there is an argument for this, Justice Scalia, for instance, says that's not punishment. Punishment is only after a criminal trial. But the idea of the Eighth Amendment is to stop a president or a king going back or to, to get rid of that idea that a high official can use power in order to subordinate, to use violence in order to subordinate. And that was the original idea of the British constraint on kingly power, to not allow a king to torture his or her political opponents into submission. But if a court is not going to intervene to protect those rights, it's up to a president and up to citizens. Many of you, by the way, are not going to be president, sorry to tell you, but you are going to vote for one. And that's why when you vote, it's essential to think about the oath that a president will take, because courts won't always be there uh, to stop him or her. Uh, let me move to a different amendment. The 14th Amendment, as I said, guarantees equal protection of the law. Uh, and a related idea, the First Amendment bans the establishment of religion or the discrimination against people based on religion, uh, the free exercise clause. Those three clauses stand for a very simple idea. We don't make laws or executive orders based on prejudice. Now, we know that we have a president currently who campaigned on the idea of a complete and total shutdown of Muslim immigration into the United States. And then when he became the president, passed a series of uh, what in the beginning were pretty obviously Muslim bans, uh, banning uh, several Muslim-majority countries from having any entry into the United States. And over time, with Rudolf Giuliani's help, Rudolf Giuliani, as he said, was asked to take the Muslim ban and make it legal. Those uh, words got papered over. The ban got tweaked in order to make it look constitutional. In my opinion, the original views of President Trump that were stated very cleanly during the election and were stated clearly after he took the oath of office were animus-based. They were motivations for this executive order that were based on the disparagement of Islam, the belief irrationally that the entire religion, unlike George Bush said, uh, was a danger. Now, when the Supreme Court had the moment where it could stop a president, four justices did exactly what I'm saying. They said this is a ban based on animus, and we're not going to uh, allow it. Four said we have to defer to a president in especially foreign relations. And one justice, Kennedy, who many of us were counting on, sort of tried to split the difference. He ultimately voted with the majority, but he wanted to defer to the president and didn't strike down this executive order. So ideally, in my view, that is a place where courts should have intervened. That was the wrong decision. But it is also an example of why there is no such thing as the Constitution police. The Constitution isn't self-reinforcing. It ju just doesn't happen that it will become enforced. We need citizens who are not only going to elect a president that respects the Constitution, but who are going to nominate, and we need a Congress, who are going to confirm justices who are also going to preserve, protect, and defend it in the face of animus.
This thing doesn't work unless citizens have it as part of their vocabulary, unless they are using it on a regular basis when they vote and when they demand that the people running for office make that a priority. So what do you do? Uh, these are uh, three instances where a president might go astray, shutting down speech that he or she, doesn't disagree, that he or she disagrees with, uh, calling for uh, torture or allowing it within the White House, and uh, this idea of animus-based executive orders. What do you do when a president disregards the oath of office? How do you stop a president? That's the last third of the book that I'm focused on. Uh, Washington, notice, in calling for constitutional punishment for himself, is recognizing that the office is different than the person. The office, in an important way, is above the person, distinct from the person who occupies it, and the person can disgrace the office, such as to require constitutional punishment. I don't think he thought he was going to be subject to it, but he was sending a message to future presidents, thus the subtitle of the book that they might be deserving and subject to constitutional punishment. So how do you do it? Uh, let me say something first about the ongoing question, very live, not used to be a hypothetical, now very live question, of whether or not you can indict a sitting president. The framers just disagreed about this. Alexander Hamilton seemed to think impeachment came first and after removal, when the former president was a private citizen, then a criminal indictment could be possible. James Wilson in the ratifying convention in Pennsylvania said the opposite. A president basically can be subject to indictment. They don't help us much. But what does help us is case law. U.S. v. Nixon, eight to zero, making it very clear uh, that one principle that my 11-year-old to who the book is, whom the book is dedicated can understand, a president is not above the law. A president who breaks the law can be subject to a criminal subpoena for information. But more than that, not just during a criminal trial, as was the case there, and you heard Judge Kavanaugh try to limit the idea to a criminal trial, but more generally, in a grand jury. And more than that, I believe, the principle stands for the idea that a sitting president, distinct from concerns about impeachment, can be subject to criminal indictment. Now, there's a memo that says otherwise. There are actually two, one written during the Nixon administration and one written later during the Clinton administration. This is a bipartisan problem, this idea of making immune a sitting president. And they rest on two ideas. One is the notion that the president is special in that he or she is the head of the executive branch and the whole branch will be imperiled if there's an indictment. Basically, the idea that the president is too busy running the country or the executive branch in order to be subject to indictment. That was answered in the Paula Jones case, Clinton v. Jones, with a very simple point. The courts can work with the president. The president has a scheduler. The nuclear suitcase can be moved around the earth at a moment's notice. They can figure out how to make time for legal proceedings if a president is criminal. The more important argument and mistaken argument, I think, is about the dignity of the office that the dignity of the office somehow immunizes a president from indictment. And I think that's answered by Washington. The person who occupies the office is distinct from the office. The office is in many ways above that person, such that if that person disgraces the office, um, they should be subject to, as Washington said, constitutional punishment. I don't know that he was referring to indictment, but the point that he was making certainly applies there. Let me say something about our friends James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, who I mentioned early on. I said uh, that their party was basically shut down by Adams. There was a time in which it was illegal to criticize the president, even if you were the vice president. Now, what did they do? They left Philadelphia, the capital, the sitting vice president and the main drafter of the Constitution who wrote the main notes that we have about it. They went back to their home state of Virginia and they got their legislatures in Virginia and Kentucky to pass a resolution saying, not that the law was nullified, Jefferson toyed with that in a draft, but that they wouldn't enforce it. They weren't going to cooperate with the federal government. Now that's a sort of less obvious strategy about resisting a president, but when you look to California, I have a former Brown student who introduced me to his uncle, Miguel Marquez, who I talk about in the book, who's leading the charge against the attempt to require localities to cooperate with ICE and hold for 48 hours uh, people who are suspected of being undocumented just because they've been stopped for a traffic violation. That's the tradition here of Jefferson and Madison refusing to cooperate legally with 
federal agencies in matters especially that are unconstitutional. That court case is going through the courts now, and uh, Marquez and, and his team uh, have won some very important early victories, a less obvious way of resisting. Uh, the final way, I'm not going to say that much about because I think you all have um, opinions about it, but the idea of impeachment I think has to be kept very distinct from the criminal question of indictment. There is no category of high crime in the criminal law. If you take 1L uh, criminal law, you're not going to learn about a, a unit called high crimes. It's a political category. And to me, what it's about is the idea of misdemeaning, lowering oneself when it comes to the office, a political criteria for thinking about whether or not there is a president that has so disgraced the office and so disregarded the oath that he or she might be subject by the Congress to a political form of constitutional punishment. Now, I'll just sum up by saying this is a very different idea of the presidency than Wilson had, certainly, than many scholars have. Many people have called for uh, expanded power of a president. I saw in a bookstore today a, a pre-Trump book about the need for a tougher presidency, a more powerful one. And I'm trying to make the case for Washington's vision of an Article II bound limited presidency. That means respect not just not violating the Constitution when it comes to free speech or the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment. It means going beyond that and doing even when the courts don't require you as a future president to respect the Constitution, going out of your way to do so. So yes, there is no jurisprudence saying the Eighth Amendment bans torture for the extraction of information by the executive branch. But a president that we elect has to respect that rule. A president also, in his or her own speech, has to use that speech to defend the Constitution, not to, as Wilson did, disregard or disgrace it. And then I ended, after talking about these provisions, with the idea of indictment. Yes, there is disagreement. I don't want to doubt it. This is something that courts will have to decide. A future Supreme Court might well decide that question, including perhaps a Judge Kavanaugh, depending on what happens. But in my view, the right answer is, yes, a president is not above the law. That idea in U.S. v. Nixon and in Clinton v. Jones. Supreme Court cases rather than memos written by mid-level Justice Department officials. I talked about state resistance, a less obvious form of stopping a president. And then finally, the clear form of constitutional punishment that all of us have to reflect on, the idea of high crimes and misdemeanors, and what it means to not just in a moment violate the oath of office, but to continually do so such that that is the appropriate response from our members of Congress. This won't happen naturally. There is no Constitution police. But it will happen if citizens demand it of a chief executive. And citizens demand it as well of a Congress who is going to appoint a justice that will have the charge of protecting the Constitution against even a powerful president that might disregard it. So thank you. Okay, so let me start by saying it is such a privilege to be back at Brown um, for Chris and I, and I don't know if anyone said we're married. We are, we're married. Um, and we brought our three kids to campus for the first time. Um, I actually think I'm going to start calling you my co-panelist, actually. Um, but so we are, all of us, delighted to be back here. Um, and so, Corey, thank you so much for writing this great book and for affording us the opportunity to come back. Um, as Susan mentioned, before I was a law professor, I spent a couple of years as a White House lawyer in the Obama administration, and when Corey stopped to check his notes to be sure that he got the language of the constitutional oath right, it reminded me of those amazing events of the first 24 hours of the Obama administration, uh, which was, um, right, some of you may be aware of this, but um, the Chief Justice has, for uh, a number of presidential cycles, administered the oath of office uh, on January 20th, the constitutionally set day for the inauguration, uh, and Chief Justice Roberts uh, came on stage on this you know, frigid cold day, January 20th, 2008, uh, and had no notes with him, and so slightly flubbed the oath of office. And so President Obama took a slightly wrong constitutional oath in the first seconds that he was the president. Uh, there were a couple of transposed words and a couple of omitted words, and I was in the White House Counsel's office uh, at the time, 
and this has all been reported, so I'm not breaking any news, but there was a little bit of a question that first day, like, is this, is there a problem? Is he really the president? <laughs> um, so the next day, um, the chief justice and the president did a, had a quiet do-over in which the chief justice administered the prescribed constitutional language and the, the president uh, repeated it back. So I don't, had he taken any major steps in that first 24 hours, could there have been a question about his being duly authorized? Because as Corey says, the language of the presidential oath is in the constitution. Other federal officials have to take oath and those oaths are referenced, but only the president's oath is actually spelled out verbatim uh, in the Constitution. So um, I tell the story because I do feel privileged to have worked for a president who I think took both the, the, the letter and the spirit of a constitutional oath uh, incredibly seriously. Um, okay, so I was going to talk about a few things that, that are in some of the things that you highlighted in your opening, uh, Corey, but I'll say I, I loved reading this book over the course of the last few weeks against the backdrop of the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, and, and I don't mean the recent um, sexual assault allegations, right? I, I'm talking about right after Labor Day, um, the week in which, you know, Judge Kavanaugh we sort of came before the Senate Judiciary Committee and was pressed by members of the committee on uh, questions of presidential power, uh, on the president's ability to remove federal officers, on when and why the Supreme Court is justified in overruling a prior case, in the relative competence uh, of courts and agencies to interpret statutes passed by Congress. Um, and you know, these hearings are no doubt less informative than they might be, right? Nominees duck and weave, um, senators are in, preening for cameras in some ways more than engaging deeply with uh, nominees. Follow-up questions are often lacking. Um, but they do hold out this promise of inviting all of the members of the political community into this conversation about how the Constitution should be interpreted, about some of its, what its sort of most opaque language might mean. Um, and I think all that was really present uh, during that first week of September. And there was a good deal of public engagement. And the numbers, um, at least some of them that I saw, bore that out. People were interested. And they aren't always in questions of the Supreme Court and the Constitution. Um, I don't know about on campus here, but at the law school, Cardozo, where I teach in Manhattan, we just put a screen in the student lounge up for the week and play the hearings and people really turned out to watch them um, and discuss them. And so, um, you know, in that regard, it, it actually reminded me of something early in this administration um, that Corey mentioned, which is the first iteration of President Trump's travel ban. Um, and, you know, it's not in any way, there were just certain, I think, uh, similarities. Um, and, and by that, what I mean by that is the president um, had issued uh, one week into the administration the first iteration of this travel ban, um, right? It, it prohibited entry into the United States, sorry, by individuals from a handful of Muslim majority countries. Um, it temporarily suspended. Uh, all refugee admissions, which had later dropped out, but was a pretty significant part of the first order, right, which we sort of forget about. Um, it indefinitely suspended the admission of Syrian refugees. Um, and the order was challenged immediately um, in a Brooklyn district court, uh, and then by the states of Washington and Minnesota um, on a number of both statutory and constitutional grounds. Um, but even before the challenges could make their way into court, um, you know, volunteer lawyers were on the ground in airports, um, searching out individuals and family members who had been denied admission. Um, and at the Brooklyn courthouse, where Chris and I were actually there, we had diverted, we were on our way to a dinner party and then diverted to the courthouse so that Chris could do a live shot from outside of the courthouse on a Saturday night, I think it was. Um, and a Cardozo law student was involved in passing a note to the ACLU lawyer who was arguing before the district court judge and someone ended up getting pulled off a plane. Um, the Brooklyn judge issued a temporary restraining order and. Um, Several other district courts followed suit quickly. Um, but in that chaotic first you know, 12 or 24 hours, it wasn't totally clear what was happening on the ground. And these occasional reports would surface that denials of admission were still ongoing, there was a lot of fear, there was a lot of uncertainty, and then it slowly became clear that the administration was heeding courts' rulings, right? That the Department of Homeland Security and the State Department were sending word to the field, that the policy was on hold, that the courts had spoken. Um, and in some ways, that's completely unremarkable. Um, but it was a campaign and an early uh, administration that had disregarded a lot of norms. And I think a lot of people watch with genuine uncertainty regarding how all of this would end. Um, abiding by judicial rulings is a norm, right? That can be challenged, that can be broken. Um, but here it wasn't, and the, the administration actually didn't even walk up to the line, I think. Um, 
And I think that was for a lot of reasons, and the courts themselves obviously issued these rulings, and that was a big part of it. But individual lawyers and law students who worked on these cases, um, lawyers at the Department of Justice, I think, who are steeped in the norms that judgments are binding in our system, um, the press, which stayed relentlessly focused on this story in those days, um, and then this last one is critical, right? Engaged members of the political community. And, um, you know, one little example of this, I remember the first, first oral argument in the Ninth Circuit, yes, an appellate argument, not even in the Supreme Court, was live streamed on the Ninth Circuit's website, and 50,000, it wasn't even video, it was just the audio, 50,000 people listened to the audio of an oral argument out of the Ninth Circuit. That was just the stream, the, the live stream from the court itself, and then CNN, played the audio live, and that's a several hundred, MSNBC did not, I don't think. Um, but that was, you know, it, it was a lot of engagement for an issue like this, and I think that matters. I think it mattered, and I think it continues to matter. Um, so, so talking about Kavanaugh, talking about the travel ban, right, um, those are about the courts. Um, and Corey's written a book, obviously, about the presidency, but I think they're connected. Um, so the book is a wonderful and accessible primer on the presidency. So it's succinct, it's thorough, um, it walks through the obligations that are incumbent on a president who takes the oath of office seriously and sort of believes in the direct obligations the Constitution imposes on him or her, right, regardless of what courts might do or say. Um, so as was obvious, I think, in the mode of address of the lecture, the book purports at points to be written to a future president. And I'm used to mostly reading law review articles. and. I think it took me a minute to, address, to sort of adjust to this mode of address, right, that the book utilizes from time to time. Um, but I came to find this mode of address of the reader as future president um, really effective and really important, and for two distinct and related reasons, right? One, it re requires the reader to occupy this role of future constitutional actor, and I think that is wonderful, especially for students and young people who are reading this book, uh, and two, because obviously most of us won't be president. Um, it does serve as a constant reminder in the midst of this overview of the Constitution's key provisions um, that we are all members of this political and constitutional community with important roles to play, and the address reinforces all of that. Um, so the book is, I think, in some ways idealistic and certainly optimistic. Um, you know, it cites several times Madison's famous quote, that if angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. Um, but it also sketches the figure of a president of great virtue. And I think is unapologetic in suggesting that this is the appropriate standard to which presidents should be held. Um, but, right, if, if they don't hold themselves to such standards, right, um, the system does have, as Corey discussed, a number of mechanisms for responding. And I do think that that is in some ways what happened with the travel ban, right? The public reacted um, in some ways out of a visceral sense that our constitution doesn't permit an order like this, whether or not that intuition actually matched up perfectly with doctrine, right? What was wrong with it? Was it an equality problem? Was it a religious discrimination? Was it about due process? But I don't think that much matters, right? Because it was this sort of constitutional intuition that, that kind of animated and mobilized and different courts came down in different ways about what the sort of the, the infirmity, whether it was statutory or constitutional, in the order or the different iterations of the order uh, was. Um, but that, I think, is what drove the reaction and the mobilization. And although it's absolutely right that the administration ultimately does prevail and the order is upheld, um, it's the third iteration of the order. And so it is, it is largely because of all of this uh, activity that precedes the final Supreme Court determination that the order is narrowed to the extent that it is by the time it goes before the Supreme Court. Um, and to bring things back, right, to um, Judge Kavanaugh, right, also as Corey says, the opinion is a 5-4 opinion, and um, Justice Kennedy, the day before announcing his retirement, uh, writes a concurring opinion um, that basically says, look, we're not gonna strike this thing down, but the president's statements, right, because the statements were a major part of the plaintiff's case against the order, these statements are genuinely troubling, and it's just that courts can't do anything about it, right? So he, he writes, there are numerous instances in which, as uh, is Kennedy writes, uh, in which the statements and actions of government officials are not subject to judicial scrutiny or intervention, but that does not mean those officials are free to disregard the Constitution and the rights it proclaims and protects. The oath all officials take to adhere to the Constitution is not confined to those spheres in which the judiciary can correct or even comment upon what those officials can do. Um, so, look, I think Corey thinks that 
Justice Kennedy was wrong here and the courts could have intervened. Um, uh, but if they don't, right, there are other ways to hold presidents accountable and for the people to develop a better understanding of what the Constitution requires of the president uh, and to use their powers to hold presidents account accountable when they uh, fail to live up to those obligations um, is one of the other mechanisms I think that Corey identifies and richly describes uh, in the last third of the book. Um, and with that, I'll wrap and I will look forward to discussing um, with my co-panelists. Thank you. Um, so this sort of jumps off what Kate was saying. I think what I really enjoyed about this book is that it forced me to ask a really central, essential question, which I think I hadn't quite phrased in, this ter in these terms yet, but is what hangs over me every day in my work and all of us as citizens right now, which is what keeps it all together? What binds American constitutionalism and American self-governance within constitutional restraints? Like, what's the thing that does it? Why doesn't it descend into anarchy or why doesn't it descend into tyranny? And that's the question, right? <laughs> There's one set of answers I think that have become very popular and Corey writes about in the book, which centers on the text itself and originalism, right? That there's a kind of almost Quranic um, way of looking at the, the Constitution that it's this sort of, you know, in some civic sense, divinely inspired um, set of, of precepts and orders and the job of, of both judges and then justices on the court and everyone else is to um, sort of understand the word capital W. And that vision has been remarkably powerful as an intellectual force in American life, most notably through the, the works of Antonin Scalia, um, who Corey writes about as well, but is really unsatisfying for a variety of reasons, not just political. One of them is just, it doesn't really hold together intellectually. One, a great point that Corey makes in the book is that judicial re review itself is not in the Constitution. The whole thing, like the, the thing that we want from the court, right, which is you can't do that, the law struck down. They were, they were smart people in Independence Hall in Philadelphia. They could have written into the Constitution in Article 3, the final word or the final adjudication of constitutional matters shall be retained by the courts. They didn't do it. So the very sort of principle of judicial reveal appears nowhere in the text of the Constitution. So it's very hard to make the case that the text itself is the thing, this charter that was entered into back then as some bind on future generations is actually what's doing the work of holding things together. So then there's a question if it's not the text itself, if it's not originalism, it's not this charter that binds together future generations, I think a, a, one way of thinking about what holds it together, and it's something that we've, I think, come to talk about recently a lot, are norms and institutions, right? Norms, institutions, traditions. So, expectations of proper action, institutions as they're built into uh, structures, things that are funded with people staffing them, and um, ways of being in the world, behaviors that coincide institutionally, that all those things sort of interlock, expectations about what is done and not done. And that to me strikes me as a pretty salient way of thinking about it, but also falls short for important ways as well, which I think Corey points out in the book. The institutions changed dramatically and radically over the course of the nation's life. The entirety of the administrative state doesn't exist for basically the first hundred years. It's, you know, Congress, the courts, a military, and a post office that's like basically like a ward healer jobs program for whichever party's in, pro in power. And you don't have all of the multifaceted things that the state is doing now then. The power to create the modern administrative state, of course, comes by constitutional means through um, a combination of both statutory uh, legislation and also constitutional amendments, the income tax that funds it, et cetera, et cetera. But that, those institutions change in such a way that the insti institution, institutional constancy itself can't be the thing that binds things together because the institutions change so much. And there's also the fact that the norms change, and I think this is actually a crucial thing to think about. We talk about, it is often the case today that we use unprecedented or a violation of norms as an argument against the actions of the president. But of course, the two greatest presidents in the American Republic, in my humble opinion, Abraham Lincoln and FDR, were norm smashers par excellence, right? <laughs> in fact, much of what makes them great, much of what makes them stick out 
from others is the fact that they disregarded many of the norms. As Corey writes in the book, the Emancipation Proclamation is definitely a departure from norms. And it seems like a very weird argument to say like, oh, here, there he is, breaking those norms again. Just freeing the slaves for executive order. <laughs> so there has to be some framework other than norms and institutions to think about what it is that's holding things together. And I think what Corey really persuasively argues in the book, and that has been sort of clarified things for me, is values. Values, constitutional values, a set of values that animate, crucially, a political culture. That really, when we're talking about what binds together American constitutional democracy and to the extent we maintain a free republic is a political culture animated by a certain set of values. The political culture, I think, is a perfect example. The political culture is exactly Kate's point about the travel ban. What leads everyone to assent to the court at that point is, yes, a norm, right? There's an established norm and expectation. But of course, norms had already been broken long ago when the president got in front of a camera and said, let's ban one-fifth of the world's population, right? So we know that there are certain norms he doesn't care about. He's been hectoring his attorney general to open in criminal inquiries into his political opponents. But the political culture at that crucial moment held. The political culture animated by a set of values. Those set of values include separated powers, religious liberty, due process, freedom of expression, judicial review, right? And that political culture is animated by a millions of different constitutional actors steeped in that culture, animated by those values. Those include the line lawyers at the Department of Justice, the judges who are hearing the argument, the people in the White House Counsel's Office, the people in the streets outside the courts. All those people are participating in civic life through a prism of a shared political culture that's animated by those constitutional values. And to me, the question then becomes the, about the health or lack of, or the health of our current political culture. Because political cultures can be healthy or unhealthy. They can be virtuous or vicious. They can be clean or corrupt. And we know this from when we look at the political cultures across the 50 states, which vary greatly. The political culture of governance in Rhode Island is very different than the political culture of governance in Minnesota. Very different than governance in Illinois or in Texas or in California. Those are distinct political cultures. The question now, I think, before the country is, what is happening to American political culture? Whether what's happening in the political culture ends up being permanent, whether it's a permanent alteration to what American political culture is, the political culture that emanates from the constitutional values that Corey describes, and how that's going to affect the nation going forward, how it affects our ability to hang together uh, going forward. And that, to me, the, the reason I think this book is so important and so good um, is because it forces you to reckon with precisely that fundamental, elemental question at this crucial moment. All right, so now we're going to talk. <laughs> it's just a pause. You don't have, no, stop. Uh, yeah, so maybe just sort of, let's talk about the travel ban example, because I think it's such a perfect example. Like, it was this question of this open question, does this hold? What's your understanding of that moment in the context of the oath? Because that moment comes about because the president is completely inured to the kind of arguments you make here. I mean, he's never gonna read the book, he doesn't read, but he also, right. he also has, he, 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 everything that's articulated here is entirely anathema to him. So you've got a president who, who has no constitutional values whatsoever and does this thing and yet it still holds why. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that really, both of your comments really get to this idea at the core of the book, that the Constitution is about the text, it is about the cases, but it's more fundamentally about values and principles. And when you elect someone whose instinct is to see the Constitution and the rule of law, and really the idea of equality under law as sort of anathema, things that he's instinctually uh, trying to get away with or around, uh, that's going to be a problem for a president that we trust is going to take the oath and the values seriously. Um, and, you know, I think he thinks of the Constitution as it's sort of like real estate law. The, the lawyers go in there and try to defend you so that you can get around it. So in the travel ban case, when you look at his campaign statements, and I think this came out in both of your co comments, uh, he just thinks, what's the problem? I don't I want to shut down Muslim immigration. He doesn't know that there's an establishment clause or a 
uh, free exercise clause or a long history of equal protection. He just thinks, I want to do that. I don't like this. And so he acts. And over time, not because there's a doctrine of animus written into the Constitution, but because the courts have discerned, not just from one provision, but from the Equal Protection Clause, from the idea that we don't have an official religion, the Establishment Clause, and from the prohibition on making laws that prohibit the free exercise of religion, the courts have wisely said uh, the motivation for a law can't be based in hate, or the technical way they put it is can't be based in animus. So that's why I thought the courts, exactly as you said, performed extremely well in the beginning and through several iterations. And in the end, it really came down to one vote. And the same person who unfortunately really has this values-based idea of the Constitution, Justice Kennedy designed uh, and brought into existence, as, as you well know, the uh, idea of uh, that not being able to discriminate, uh, uh, not just based on uh, race or ethnicity, but also based on sexual orientation. He created that. And when he had his key moment where he could use that value-based reading of the Constitution, uh, he fumbled. And uh, so much the worse. Now, I, I think also, you know, as Kate said, all the more reason for us to pick up the, uh, to do it ourselves and to ensure that the culture uh, has these values uh, as part of it. Um, so thanks. I think that you both perfectly captured what I was after in, in the book. Will you talk a little bit about the, so this, this is written to presidents, but um, the people that really, I mean, the president makes a bunch of decisions, but the people that run a White House are the staff, and you are a White House staffer. Like, the degree to which, as just a descriptive matter, these kinds of concerns are animating when you're going to work in the White House every day in the White House counsel's office. You know, you don't, you don't get as much... Uh, like orientation as you might expect, right, to being a White House lawyer. You sort of, I mean, I, I walked in with a lot of the White House staff on Inauguration Day, and you are, you know, kind of in this video game style responsive mode from basically the first moment because things are flying at you. And this is, I think, especially true um, in January 2009 um, when you had you know, this the financial crisis, right, that needed to be, that sort of the, the, the administration needed to work its way out of and, um, doing financial regulatory reform, trying to get health care passed, very quickly Supreme Court vacancy. I mean, I'm talking about my particular experience, which is really all I can speak to. But, um, but I think it's right that there isn't as much time to sit before beginning to, to do the job and think deeply about, you know, sort of if you're a White House lawyer, who are your obligations to? You have the particular president, you have the office of the presidency, you have the federal government, you have the American people, the kind of client relationship. It's all complicated and I think you sort of just it's a kind of building the airplane while flying sort of a style and so there isn't as much time as you would hope um, to think deeply I think about about these questions um, before you're in the position of dispensing legal advice um, I think that's true of every White House um, so I think that the culture to return to your remarks really does matter and if sort of if if the general, if the ethos of a White House, and I think this was very much true of the White House that I worked in, is, um, uh, you know, there's not, there wasn't ever a moment of um, anything self-regarding, right, or about sort of personal advancement or anything like that that I think the president or individual White House staffers were ever animated by, ever. Um, uh, you know, attempting to, to sort of discharge with sort of all of our, everyone's lim got limitations, but sort of to put all of your training and energy to, you know, effectuating the president's policy vision and, you know, and that was, you know, to, to put it very simply, just improving, right, the sort of conditions of all Americans. It was really that simple. And so I don't, I never felt like there was any real hard questions about tension between any proposed course of conduct and kind of constitutional requirements because a lot of the background assumptions, I think, aligned so well. Um, and that's, I mean, I, I probably have an idealized vision of um, the president for whom I worked um, uh, and, and, you know, these are all obviously people. Um, but, uh, but, but I think that, you know, you only really have the hard questions arise when, when there is misalignment or friction. And in some ways, um, I think that, that, that it's, it's almost sort of harder to figure out why it all aligned um, or to even explain it because it, was, it, was, it, it almost happened at, at such a deep level that there was this alignment. Do you, one, of, one of the things that you, I think, argue in the book, although you, don't, you do quite come out and say it in certain points, is that the, the executive's grown too powerful. Um, and that's uh, a, a deviation from 
both the founder's vision but also our constitutional values of divided governance. Um, is there something salutary, salutary about having like an aggressively incompetent executive, <laughs> theoretically, for the, for the purpose of ratcheting back executive power, which it does seem to be like, okay, you want a lot of executive power, here, here it is in the hands of this individual. And you're seeing people have these conversations. There's actually legislation about first strike nuclear weapons. Like, should it be the case the president can just annihilate a, a, a sizable portion of the living souls on earth um, without any checks? And that question, which seems an obvious and profound one we should wrestle with, becomes much more front of mind in, in circumstances in which maybe certain portions of the population don't trust the president to dispatch that duty. Yeah, um, thanks. I mean, of course, it, it depends in part how this story ends, and my hope is that that's exactly how it ends. <laughs> not nuclear war. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, not. I think we're, not, all pull, right. we're all pulling for that one. <laughs> no, but in, in war powers, I mean, that's one of the lessons that we have allowed. You know, it's Congress that initiates war and declares war, and it's a president that is the commander-in-chief, and we've strayed from that, and presidents uh, seem to have increased, and there's a, both a court, it's a perfect storm, because the port courts aren't willing to stop that, and presidents take on this idea that they can initiate, the War Powers Act was a problem. So that's one area that I'm pretty precise in saying, you know, not just for this president, but really for future presidents, regardless of party, we have to rein in a president's war power. The other fundamental place uh, that is playing out right now is we used to, during the Clinton administration, have a law that, uh, allowed uh, an independent prosecutor investigating a president, looking into wrongdoing in the White House and by the president, him or herself, was protected from firing unless there was good cause. And that law expired in the Clinton administration, partly because it was thought that the abuses of Ken Starr were so extreme. And so I say in the book, regardless of party, we need a new law that protects either this special prosecutor or we should go back to the old system of having an independent prosecutor protected uh, unless you can show that he's, he or she's not doing the job right. Yeah, um, I, I think one, so, so one of the things you saw in, if you really closely followed the um, Kavanaugh confirmation hearings is you do have in constitutional and administrative doctrine kind of these two strains of cases, um, the cases that that, and, and in particular, the case upholding the independent counsel statute under which Ken Starr was appointed, uh, although not the case didn't pre predated the, the Starr appointment and investigation. Um, uh, so you have you know, some cases that do say a degree of independence inside the executive branch um, is permissible. Um, so, you know, we don't want too much kind of roving independent authority, but, but a degree is permissible. Um, and then you have a, a strain that is very uh, nervous from this perspective of this unitary executive, um, that the president, sort of all power in the executive branch must ultimately flow up to the president and the president must exercise um, genuine control over all subordinate officials in the executive branch. And there's just tension between those two lines of cases. And, um, and you know, you saw Judge Kavanaugh sort of trying to suggest that, 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 you know, the ones that allow a degree of independence inside the executive branch um, are fine and consistent with constitutional design, but some of his writings have suggested deep skepticism about uh, that principle. And, and it may well be that, you know, to the extent that the, who knows what happens with this confirmation, um, but that, that one of the, 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 the takeaways from this era um, is that the cases that do allow a degree, that, 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 that find a degree of independence consistent with our independence inside the executive branch, apart from the president, to be consistent with our constitutional design, are just not gonna be on safer footing. I think that's an absolute possibility. Because there's, there's case law supporting a number of different positions, and it's, it's in this kind of uneasy tension at the moment. Well, and it relates to something that is both uh, a central through line of the book and in the news right now, and something that I don't think I quite grasped until I read the book, because I've never taken constitutional law, um, other than sort of through osmosis. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, and so I, I guess I didn't quite realize like how central the question of hiring and firing <laughs> has been like all the way to the you know the Marbury versus Madison is is a is a hiring case and um, and and this the the real essential question of like like who who does the president have the power to fire and when the first impeachment is about a hire is about hiring and firing. And it's really the big question before the country right now, right? I mean, this question of um, 
could, you know, was firing James Comey, for instance, which is clearly in some sense, not in some sense, in the, in the letter of the laws within the authority of the President of the United States, unquestionably, but can he exercise your constitutional authority in a way so obviously inimical to, inimical to the rule of law and to constitutional values that it's actually an action in furtherance of obstruction of justice and thus impeachable? And that's like this, the, this sort of elemental question right now that, that's sort of before the country. Yeah, and I think it also goes to your other question, um, you know, we're, we're, which is the idea that when we see a president that we like, well, Bill Clinton is a good president, let's not have him subject to investigation. Right, right. And I think that's been the problem with the way that we view this. It's, it's been a partisan lens, and we need to start abstracting and thinking about the presidency more generally. I mean, to me, when you look at the Saturday Night Massacre where um, uh, Richard Nixon um, kept firing his attorneys general until he could get a special prosecutor fired, uh, you know, it turned out okay, he did resign, but that was a different political culture, it was a different Congress, and my worry is now that this president can get away with it. And so the next time, to prevent us from ever being in a situation like this again, that's why I think we need to create, the Congress needs to pass laws that say the president is not above the law, and we're going to protect an investigation of the president from uh, not allow the president to be a judge in his or her own case and just get rid and sweep away an investigation of potentially criminal conduct. This is a, a hopefully a lesson for the country in the problem with an unlimited or unbound presidency and an argument for why, to me, that's exactly what I, I'm trying to do in the book, for, for returning to the rule of law. Um, maybe we'll take questions in a, in a few minutes. Um, one thing that I wanted you to talk about, Kate, a little bit was, is the fact that there's a kind of sort of interesting perspectival thing happening in the book, right? You're the, the second person address of you as the president. And one thing I think that happens, this is true in my job, cable news, that, you know, from the outside it looks incredibly powerful, and from the inside it's like all you feel are constraints. And I think that happens to presidents all the time. I mean, they're like, man, I'm going to get in there and like bada bing, bada boom. And then next thing you know, it's like, I don't have my wall, I don't have my Muslim ban, I got like, what do I got? I got bubkis. And, and I think a lot, of, a lot of presidents feel that way. Um, did, did you feel working, like, what was the sense of constraint working in the White House? Was that a, was that a presence? Because I think that's actually part of what our constitutional values are, that, that, that sense of constraint, and really the, maybe the frustration about it. Um. Yeah, I think, I think I felt this way in the White House, and I think this, I, I feel this way now as someone who thinks and writes about these things. The president um, is more powerful today than uh, historically, but also quite constrained, right? If you read, you know, the famous Youngstown case, right, the president only gets to act if he has constitutional authority or specific statutory authority. So he is not just this kind of roving power center. He has to have power given to him through one of those two specific mechanisms. And the Constitution only gives the president now the spheres in which he's given power, right? Um, you know, foreign affairs, military matters, the commander in chief clause, those are really important spheres. But when we're talking about making domestic policy, Congress is in the driver's seat, right? It is as a descriptive matter, and of course, normatively, it should be. Um, and so I think the president absolutely does feel constrained. Um, you know, what the president obviously does have, which is not explicitly, right, granted in the Constitution or in a statute, but Corey talks about in the book, is the power of the bully pulpit, right? So what the president can do is go directly to the public and speak to the entire public on behalf of the entire nation, right, on matters both domestic um, and international, and in that way wields tremendous power, right? But it's a kind of informal power, and I think the two can be confused, right? So that's that, that's another important lesson, right? The president uh, is constrained both feels and actually is. Um, and maybe just repeating that and remembering it is important um, to actually seeing a president act in a more constrained way. Well, that's a gr it's a great point because you, you spend a lot of time in the bully pulpit, which by the way, I'm sure this is, everyone knew this, but it was new to me that like just bullied then just meant awesome. <laughs> everyone, did everyone know that? You're nodding your head. I, I didn't know that. Um, that that you spend a lot of time in the bully pulpit and, and it is fascinating to think of the, the centrality of rhetoric and presidential speech in the modern presidency as an entirely sort of extra constitutional um, development. I mean, when you think about like right now, particularly, it's like, oh my God, I can't with the presidential speech enough. I got, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of presidential speech, a lot of it all the time. And, but none of that is, in the beginning, there's very little of it. 
And now it's almost, it's almost like the majority of what the president does. Well, I mean, I think, you know, when you look at Wilson, that was the point I was trying to make, too, in the, in the lecture and in the book, that there's a deliberate connection. He's trying to expand the power of the presidency, and he's using this so right. sort of new power, the bully pulpit, to do it. Now, with Trump, it's that times 10. Yeah. Because think of the bully pulpit. There is a, the press. It's you are in between, right? You have to speak to people through the press office. Now, Trump doesn't have to do that. He has Twitter. Right. He speaks directly to people, and thankfully- He's also didn't. got these awesome Rose Garden videos, <laughs> which he calls, this, <laughs> he calls the storm tremendously big and tremendously wet. It's <laughs> one of my favorite coinages ever for a hurricane. And how about his ability uh, through, I mean, I, you, you can tell me, but there are you know, at least rumors that he's looking at other techniques for yeah. talking to us through yeah. our cell phone. <laughs> right, yeah. Now, that's, that's frightening when you combine it with the, the possibility that the speech won't be used to preserve, protect, and defend the right. Constitution, but will, will be used war on for very different purposes. Yeah, yeah exactly. We're, we're in a dangerous time. I think those constraints, absolutely, I agree that they're there, they're part of our tradition, but my worry is that they can be eroded too, and that's what the book is about. As you said, Kate, in your, your remarks, that people have to know about this. The staffers have to know. Newstadt tells the story in his book that at one point a Nixon staffer came up and said, he wrote a book about presidential power, and he said, we all read your book. It's your fault too. And he said, I, what? I assume this was within the constraints of the presidency. We had all read, uh, we'd take, taken civics, we had read Corwin on, on constitutional constraints. And, and so that's what I'm trying to bring back are those norms and that culture uh, uh, for all of us and also for the staff. And if the president won't read them to himself, there is a book on tape, maybe we could send it to him. <laughs> Well, thank you, Kate and Chris and Corey. Let's open it now for your questions. I want to remind everyone that this event is being recorded and live streamed. So when you make your, uh, when you pose your question, please do keep that in mind. I believe we're gonna take our first question in the back and otherwise please line up at the microphones. Hi, good evening. My name is Christopher Lighty. I'm a class of 90. Uh, and uh, I'd like to, on the behalf of the Brown Club of Rhode Island, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Brett Schneider, for both uh, your lecture and your book or talk. And uh, welcome back, Kate and Chris. Uh, I suggest you go to the admissions office and to start the process for your kids now. Um, <laughs> um, if you'll indulge me, just a little bit of questions set up, uh, taking the uh, speaker's uh, comments about questions short. So uh, political scholars like yourself, Professor, uh, Schneider and now Professor Shaw, uh, as well as uh, cable pundits like Chris, I'm sure use uh, frequently the pendulum expression for swinging of politics. And of course, it's not just the United States anywhere. But I'd like to posit that there is another thing to consider, which is sort of an extension on that, is the engineering concept of resonance. And both the uh, simple and not so good. Simple is, you know, you have your finger on a wine glass and you can make it sing. And it doesn't have to be crystal, that's a myth. The other thing is the bridge in Tacoma that fell apart due to oscillation and uh, not even in that much wind. And I would like to say that it, there's a scary proposition that for the next Congress, although I think more specifically the topic at hand, the president, there is probably multiple levels of course correction that are going to be required. And my concern is that we have a situation where in a system where you have a closer resonance, all you have to do is push it one way or the other and it goes into oscillation and things break. And the problem is that if the executive is somewhat uniquely positioned to correct things through things like executive orders, you're de facto in a region where it's highly controversial. I don't think you can say it's extra constitutional, but it's definitely in that tricky realm. But if that's the only way to fix things, how do we avoid the system blowing up where even a minority can then react to the correction? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point in question. I mean, one place I think we see this is with, the, is with Supreme Court nominee confirmations, right? I mean, I think we're headed towards a place, uh, the natural equilibrium is that no majority Senate, no Senate will ever confirm a justice of the other party's president, 
right? Because that, 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 that's the way things are going to, and then you're going to start to see that more and more. Like, do you not confirm the Secretary of State of the other party's president? Like, why, why confirm them? They're from the other party. You've got the majority of the Senate. Why do it? And it does feel dangerous. It does feel like you, you, that, that's going to oscillate more and more and start to get very dangerous to the system. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the other danger is, um, and if you read uh, Kate Shaw's wonderful editorial today in the New York Times, which I highly recommend, you'll, you'll see this point too. There, there is also a danger, which is that the Congress doesn't act and take its co-equal role seriously and, um, you know, vet a nominee. Now, I, I'll say I had a piece in Politico about this nominee, and uh, Kate also pointed out his views seem to oscillate. Well, they oscillate in a particular way that's resonant with what all three of us have been saying. When he is prosecuting a Democratic president, he seems to believe uh, that a president is not above the law and that U.S. v. Nixon applies in a very broad way. And then he begins to work for a Republican president, and he starts to say uh, things about, you know, immunity and the, the narrowness of U.S. v. Nixon, and even flirts at one point with the possibility that this core case was wrongly decided. Now, to me, you know, that speaks to the danger of the possibility that the Supreme Court might abdicate its role. Yes, U.S. v. Nixon was an example of an 8-0 decision with Rehnquist. Uh, recusing himself, of stopping a president who was engaged in uh, what looked like criminal wrongdoing. Now, what happens next time? Watch this confirmation process. That, to me, is the real danger, that you might get a more extreme Supreme Court that goes the opposite of the direction I'm suggesting about presidential power that might increase rather than decrease it. And one last thing, just to, to, the, to the question. I think that the, whoever comes after this president is going to have to sort of correct, course correct in both a formal way and a substantive way. Right? Like, there's going to be substantive corrections in terms of policy, but there's also going to be uh, choices for forbearance or choices to uphold institutional norms as a means of reconstituting what's been broken. That's going to be hard because there's going to be a temptation to just break them further in sort of retaliation. So we'll take another question. I would invite us all to remember we only have about 10 more minutes. I do have to say that it's a pleasure and a thrill for me to be here to say this to you publicly, Chris. You are not an enemy of the state. Thank you. You, you are a lifeline to our democracy. That is outrageous, the pressure that that's put on your family, on Rachel's family, on all of you. It is absolutely outrageous, and I hope you can feel our love and support. We, we will not tolerate that. Had to get that in, so glad to say that to you in a public forum. But my question is just really about the norms. I think this has been kind of a, an educative experience for me. For instance, Mer Merritt Garland, not that they could actually hold it 300 days. I think many of us thought there was a law. What's up with this? It's not a 90 day. And that's just one example. Go on and on with these norms. What an educative process. And one of the, you know, our congressmen here, Cicilline and White House, they're great people. We communicate with them. Do a whole bunch of things now have to be codified that I so naively thought was norms? Great question. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think, uh, but, but codification requires an active Congress that is interested in defending its institutional prerogatives, right? And that's, um, uh, you know, that's not, that, that, that won't fix um, the, I don't think the Supreme Court confirmation issue, but, but, but insofar as many, I think all the time about the transition, just the period of a few months from this administration to the next administration, whenever that is, there's actually very little statutory law that governs how power sort of crossfades between an outgoing and an incoming administration. Um, and I think a lot of codification actually would be extremely helpful there. It's actually a really vulnerable period for the country when there's this you know figure who's the president-elect who doesn't possess or exercise formal authority um, and yet needs to be up, getting up to speed on intelligence matters and other things. And, all of that just happens through custom and norm and practice. Um, that's one small example, but it does feel to me like actually formalizing um, a lot of what is what has traditionally just been norm driven. And we've done this before, even you know with with, with presidents whose norm smashing we have. Uh, for the most part, found uh, more favorable, right? Um, like, right, we had only a norm of a two-term president, right, before FDR, and then we amended the Constitution to formalize it. Um, so a lot of norm smashing has been followed um, by codification, either through statute or constitutional amendment, um, and some of that, I think, would be appropriate, but it requires Congress, and that is the big question. Let's see the question here. Hi, thank you so much for coming here. I'm a sophomore here at Brown, Houston Public Policy. I sort of wanted to ask you um, about your point about political culture and the health of political culture. You sort of talked about regionalism and how that plays into political culture. And so I was wondering if you could say if there was um, 
if it was accurate to describe having an overarching political culture or if American political culture was simply an amalgam of regional cultures and the sort of overarching political culture is sort of a romanticization of America that we try to tell ourselves? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, um, I think it's sort of both. So there's really distinct regional political cultures. I mean, the political culture of Mississippi for years was the culture of um, apartheid tyranny. Uh, there was a government that was just straight up dictatorial. Um, it was putatively democratic, but it just imposed complete uh, apartheid tyranny upon its uh, non-white subjects. And that was the, polit like, the political culture of that place was that. that was, everything was in furtherance of those val values. We talk about values, it was like, that, those were the values of the political culture in Mississippi. You know, the political culture of a place like Massachusetts was very different. Um, and so I think there's, there's sort of an amalgamum, but I think that the thing that does bind us is there is kind of a sort of national political culture when we talk about national political questions um, that embodies, again, at its best, at its best, values about equal, equality under the law, due process, freedom of expression, um, you know, separation of powers, judicial review, restraint, all those things, I think, are embodied in the national political culture. And one thing I would say that I think is a really important thing to keep in mind is that it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tendency to look back in the past and be like, well, they didn't know any better. But at every point of these big controversial controversies, there are people at the time saying what the constitutional values are. It's true in Plessy v. Ferguson. It's true during the Trail of Tears when there's members of Congress on the floor of the United States House of Representatives saying it is an absolute abomination and a moral outrage to send the Cherokee in the way that Andrew Jackson is uh, ordering them. Uh, it is true in Korematsu. It is true time and time again that at these moments, there are people in with the contemporaneous values that they're equipped with saying that the thing that now looks obviously wrong is in fact wrong, that those values are actually pretty enduring and accessible throughout the life of the nation. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, in the Woodrow Wilson case, I don't think we let him off the hook on the grounds that he was a product of his time. He was a constitutional law professor. He read one of the most important dissents in constitutional law by Justice Harlan and Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, saying separate is not equal and denying the compatibility of the culture of segregation and the Equal Protection Clause, uh, he knew better. And so the idea that he was just a product of his time or of a region, I think, is wrong. And so we should, I think, be critical. Uh, it's certainly true that we have a pluralistic society. We have a society that had slavery in it and that had segregation. Uh, and these values have by no means always been instantiated in our policy. But when the court and when a president thinks about the history and the meaning of the tradition over time, they have to rise above that. And that's when they look to the Constitution, which tells us in its ban on cruel and unusual punishment, in its cruel and unusual clause, and in its defense of the rule of law and the due process clause, uh, that these values rise above any of these, uh, these historical injustices and uh, violations of it. So you both, I thought, captured that beautifully. I, I thank you both for, for such a deep, deep reading of the book. Please. Hello, my name is Sonny. I'm a second year student here. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, congratulations on your new book, Professor uh, Brett Schneider. And my question, so, uh, it seems like uh, in, uh, through this office, uh, this executive office has moved us uh, farther from what uh, you would call the uh, value democracy, one in which uh, in the public sphere, the state espouses its values uh, through democratic expression and uh, citizens uh, habitually practice uh, reflective revision. So my question has to do with, uh, as a young person, what can young people do? And uh, what can the next president do to ensure that we move closer to a value democracy rather than the uh, militant one that we have currently? I mean, w one of the nice things about this panel and why I, I really am grateful to you both for coming is that we, we've all three of us, I feel like it's a team effort, we should get co-authorship maybe on the next version of the book. It, we've been pushing this point that, it, you know, this isn't gonna come from nowhere. It's gonna come from a culture in which uh, this is out there. And that's part of why I wrote the book is because it's an attempt to try to get people to talk about a modest attempt, but maybe with both of your help, this, this will <laughs> succeed, to get people to talk about the Constitution, to see this as your document, that it isn't something that's left to uh, Supreme Court justices who all went to, you know, several elite schools, that it is Just about... Just two, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that it, that it, right. <laughs> two. <laughs> that it, it's about the population's ability to claim the document and these values for themselves, in uh, the way they talk about politics, in their demands of public officials. And uh, you know, without that, we, we've got nothing. 
So we are at 6.30, but let's take two more questions, one on this side and one on that side. So um, do you think that the 2020 election will be a sort of litmus, litmus test on uh, how our political culture, which Chris talked extensively about, um, how much Americans actually care about the Constitution and restraint? You know, do you think there's a chance that maybe you've gotten this wrong and that Trump's America is really the long-term future of this country? Yes. There totally is a chance. I mean, there have been changes to political culture that have been enduring um, and, and changes to the size and shape of the office and how the office conducted itself. There's things that people found outrageous that actually proved to be enduring features of the office. There's lots of things Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson, who to my mind was an absolute scoundrel, um, you know, totally permanently changed the office of the presidency in many ways. Um, and so, Yes, it is possible that, um, first of all, I do think the 2020 election will be in many ways a referendum on exactly this, the nation's constitutional values, its belief in the rule of law. There's going to be substantive battles on things like trade and immigration and things like that. But in, at some level, I think it's actually going to be very front and center, um, this sort of democratic question, this constitutional question. As to the possibility that, like, that those values don't endure, I think that's a real possibility. I mean, I remember... Back in 2016, people coming up to me and being like, can Trump win? And I would say, yes, of course he can win. In fact, any major party nominee in America, anyone in this room who is nominated to be a major party nominee would have within a coin flip chance of being the next president of the United States. It's just the way it works. It's how polarization works. So yeah, nothing, nothing is foreordained. I mean, there is a vision of history that says, you know, we're always going to inevitably progress, that things will get better. I don't hold that view. I think to the contrary, if you're not vigilant, things might go in exactly the opposite direction. And so when I say this is a book for the country, it's because, you know, this little constitutional law professor with his hypotheticals, you know, people might just say, who cares? I want that guy who's up there who's, you know, the reality TV star who's uh, saying these things that are hysterically funny when he comes up with names for political opponents. And, you know, it might well be that that's what gets ratings and that the Constitution is, you know, uh, you know not, not the thing that gets the Constitution the doesn't rate. <laughs> so it's not inevitable. And that's why I'm, you know, going to, I'm right now, the three of us, and I'm, I think all three of us will continue to do our best to try to send that, that message out there because there's, there's, it's not clear who's going to win out in this. And it is a battle between the ballot battles of uh, defenders of the values of the Constitution, the Equal Protection Clause, the idea of free speech, uh, the idea of not discriminating based on religion, those are, they, there are opponents of those values and they are out there in the culture and they are getting attention and in some cases they're marching, think of Charlottesville. Uh, so no, it's not inevitable and that's why we all have to be vigilant and try our best and not, not just try our best, we have, we have to win. And our last question for tonight. Um, I was just wondering about the recent New York Times piece about Rosenstein and kind of the implications of that with relation to the power's ability to fire people, but also his discussion of the 25th Amendment and kind of where that plays into controlling the president. Great question. I, I was juggling kids, so I actually even haven't read the, the piece, so I want to use read it carefully. There's, I mean, I can talk about the 25th Amendment, but I'm not actually Washington sure what's Post broken. Each have, each have versions of a story about the fact that there are leaked memos that were made by Andrew McCabe and maybe others, Lisa Page, about Rosenstein's conversations with them early in the early days after Comey was fired, in which Rosenstein suggests the possibility of the 25th Amendment to others and possibly recruiting other cabinet members, including Jeff Sessions and John Kelly, who's then the head of DHS, into the 25th Amendment Pact. There's some question about whether he suggests wearing a wire on the president, although it's Rosenstein, although it seems quite clear to me from the reading of that part of the memo that it was a, it was a joke. But how about this? Like, can he fire Rosenstein? Yeah. And what's the deal with the 25th Amendment? Um, he probably can, although maybe not directly, right? He. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Mueller can't probably go, yeah, Rosenstein, no, no, you definitely fire Rosenstein, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, the 25th Amendment is, I think, a, a, something people have reached for, um, but it's really difficult to use. It's harder than impeachment. So if the president objects, now if the majority of the cabinet and the vice president agree that a president can no longer discharge the powers and the duties of the office, the president sort of says, okay, then it's done. But in section four of the 25th Amendment, there's a mechanism that's laid out that says if the president objects, he says, no, no, I'm fine. I'm not going anywhere. Then the Congress has to remove him and they have to both houses do by supermajority, I think, have to remove him. I haven't looked at the language for a while. I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, and 
that's harder than I, I mean, you know, a majority vote will get him impeached in the House. You still need a supermajority in the Senate if we're talking impeachment. You need supermajorities in both under Section 4. So I just don't know. Now, what it would do is send a real message. It's the cabinet that triggers it. So it would send a real message. If the cabinet believes the president is unfit, maybe that emboldens Congress you imagine? to move in a way that just, that the kind of self-starting nature of impeachment is an obstacle, whereas you're responding to something the cabinet asks you to do, it's different. But you need a Congress that's willing to act in order to actually remove a president under the 25th Amendment. And so it's just a lot easier said than done. I've been trying to do the vote count. So Betsy DeVos, I, I don't know that that's... Because <laughs> you have to count, it's the majority of the cabinet and the vice president. So maybe the vice president, but when you start to count these cabinet officials, is Betsy DeVos going to vote to... And I think it goes to a, a point that Kate was making pretty early on in the discussion, which is, you know, it's one thing when you have a cabinet and a staff that have internalized the values of the Constitution, then maybe they would act if all of a sudden, uh, you know, the President of the United States turned on a dime and started violating the Constitution. But when you have a cabinet and a president and a culture of the White House that seems not only to understand the values, but to disregard the rule of law and to be hostile to them, really, I think it's much more than not respecting them. How you get that, that, that exactly as you said it, that tough vote count, I, I think that's hard to do. Well, let's continue our conversation out in the foyer afterwards. Please join me in thanking Kate Thank Shaw, you both. Thank Chris you for Hayes, joining us. Thanks for coming back, and welcome home.